Um, yeah, really excited to be here. This is actually my first time at FFConf, and it's been a really amazing conference. So I'm really excited to be speaking to you all about web accessibility. And yeah, it really follows on really well from um, Angela's talk about just you know HTML accessibility, the web, the building blocks of the web. So hopefully leads right in. Um, so. You may have heard this before, but by default, HTML is accessible. So a lot of the work of web accessibility is more about ensuring that it actually remains accessible. So just broadly speaking, we can define web accessibility as the um, inclusive practice of ensuring there are no barriers that prevent access to websites. And as we've discussed, this is about making websites accessible for everyone. But I think when we think about accessibility, it's really important to think about three groups of people because they have actually quite specific access needs. So firstly, we have people with physical disabilities, which is what we typically think about when we think about accessibility, like making your website able um, for someone who has like a visual impairment to be able to use their screen reader. Um, but we also have things like situational disabilities. So this is more like a temporary situation or um, a temporary disability in which maybe like I think the typical example is someone holding like a baby in one hand and they're basically only able to um, use their websites with the other hand. So even though they do technically have two working hands, it's similar to um, if they only had one or maybe you've had like, I don't know, laser eye surgery and you can't actually use your computer and you actually have to use like a screen reader or something like that. Um, but accessibility also refers to how people with socioeconomic restrictions can access websites. So if you are from you know, a certain country and maybe you are going to be extremely data conscious, that might limit what types of websites that you can actually have access to because it may be too expensive to actually load up a particular site. But yes, we've said accessibility is basically just about inclusion and about making sure the website works for as many different people as possible. And um, as you probably know, when we talk about web accessibility, um, the definitive standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And they basically group the guidelines under four key principles. So first, that content must be perceivable. So this just means that you should be able to perceive the content with one or more of your senses. Then the user interface um, components need to be operable. So that means you need to be able to actually you know, interact or operate the site using whatever input device that you choose. Then content must be understandable, pretty self-explanatory. You need to kind of understand what you're doing as you're navigating the website. And then finally, the code must be robust. So this just means that it should be able to be interpreted by um, user agents, including assistive technologies. So what do we mean when we say that HTML is by default accessible? So firstly, there's a bit of a caveat to this in that you have to still use it correctly. So, but the point of it is that basically most of the time when you're using just you know, plain old semantic HTML, you come out with something that is accessible. So if you have you know, typical website that is just only HTML, you can see that most of the time, if you do like you know tests on it, it just passes all accessibility checks with flying colors. But this is not to say that HTML can't be accessible. There's definitely stuff that we can do to make a purely HTML website inaccessible. So we could you know fail to provide like text alternatives for non-text content, or we can just use the wrong elements for things. So using like a span instead of a label. Or you can actively do some damage using like tab index to just like change things around if you're actually trying to be evil for whatever reason. Um, but the point is that for the most part, if you have just HTML, it's a pretty good website and it's kind of just pretty good on its own. But then when you add, you know, CSS and JavaScript, <laughs> it kind of starts to really mess things up. <laughs> and we can do some pretty damaging things with CSS and JavaScript. So. With CSS, we can like add really important content via CSS. People do this for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> or with JavaScript, you can just completely like alter element behavior or make something do something that it shouldn't really be doing. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I would say like 90% of accessibility is about using HTML correctly, and then the other 10% is about making sure you don't use 
CSS and JavaScript incorrectly. And um, yeah, that's basically what this talk is about. So how do we not or use CSS and JavaScript in a way that will actually like not impact or maybe even help web accessibility? So first, CSS and accessibility. So I think it's always helpful to you know, take a step back and remember, OK, what is the purpose of CSS? And Angela also covered this, which is basically to describe the presentation of an HTML document. So while HTML provides you know, the content and the structure of a web page, CSS describes how that content and structure visually looks or is visually presented. And if we look at the path towards how you know, a web page is built, so from our HTML and CSS all the way to what is actually like painted on the screen, we can see how these components are used together. So from our, CSS, for, from our HTML, we get our document object model. And this basically just includes um, all the HTML elements, their content, and things like that. Then from our CSS, we get the CSS object model, which um, includes all the styles for each of the elements. And then these two together, minus any elements that are not going to actually be visibly painted on the screen, then forms the render tree. And what's important to note is that these two elements, HTML and CSS, together form what is the render tree and then what is painted on the page. But when we're talking about um, what assistive technologies or user agents see, it's actually not really all of this. It's actually mostly just HTML and the DOM, because this two together is what is then used to derive the accessibility object model. And this is basically just looking at each interactive element on the page, and then it has information like the name of the element, what its role is, the state it currently is, which is all really crucial information for anyone trying to navigate a page using assistive technologies. So for people just navigating visually, if you're trying to fill out a form like this, it's pretty easy to just look at it and determine, OK, what is actually happening here? So you can see there's a choice. You can see there's yes and no. One of them is selected. You can see the label for the checkbox. But if you can't actually just look at it, the only way to get all of this information is from the accessibility object model. And that's why, again, to like reiterate what Angela said, that it's really important to have this distinction between the HTML for the content and then the CSS for the styling, and making sure that you're not using CSS for what HTML is actually for. Which kind of brings me to my first point, in that we shouldn't be using CSS to convey any of that meaning or content that HTML is actually supposed to be used for. So we see this in when we are trying to maybe like use CSS to convey that, oh, an HTML or an element or a form element is, has an error or has success. If the only way you're going to convey that is through styling a border, for example, then that's something that just wouldn't be able to be communicated to users of assistive technologies. But I'll say like one of the most explicit ways that we've seen this where you know CSS is being used to add some content is with the actual like the content property. And um, this is generally a bad idea. <laughs> but to explain why, um, CSS generated content is not always reliably actually accessible to assistive technologies. So this is a great article that just sort of goes through the breakdown of all the assistive technologies and then all the browsers and OK, what is supported or what supports CSS generated content. And as you can see, there's basically just a huge mix. And the summary of this article is that basically you shouldn't use that CSS generated content to like create or alter any important information on the page. So aside from adding new information um, with CSS, we also shouldn't be using CSS to like change the content or the meaning on the page. And I would say like a common pitfall in which this happens is when we're trying to like hide things with CSS and maybe not doing the best job at it. <laughs> And as we know, there are many different ways to hide something visually with CSS. So all the way from display none to visibility hidden, opacity, position absolute. And all of these will result in the same thing visually. So to a sighted user, they're basically all the same. But they all um, differ quite drastically in how they impact things under the hood. So being a, from 
whether the box model is generated, whether it affects the layout, and then crucially, whether it's able to be read by assistive technologies. So I think in most cases, we typically use display none because for the most part, we're trying to, yes, hide something visually, but also not have it affect layout. But the problem here is that it's then not going to be able to be read by assistive technologies. So if we have the example of something like a tooltip, so we may want to have something here where you hover, then the extra information appears. And maybe when it's not being hovered over, you think that using display none would be the best way to do this. But um, if we do that, then that means that that content isn't going to be accessible to screen readers. So yeah, you can see not read by assistive technologies. And so you might think maybe using the visibility property would be better. But I think this is one of those properties that's very poorly named <laughs> because it's not really just about visibility. Because as you can see here, um, I have like three elements here. You can see that there is something in the middle, the second element, that has visibility hidden. So it's still taking up space on the page, but it's just like, you, know, you just can't see it. So it operates maybe more like an invisibility cloak than anything else because it's still there. It's still like affecting things. Like if you went and tried to like touch it, you'll see it's still there, but you just can't really see it. So I would say, um, well, personally, I feel like there's almost no use case in which using visibility hidden makes sense. And I have yet to see a good use case. So if you do have a good use case, you can try and find and convince me. But I feel like in most cases, just using opacity zero is going to give you the same effect. And then at least this is going to be able to be read by assistive technologies. But basically, the solution here, I think, in most cases where you want something to be hidden but still accessible to screen readers, just using like position absolute and essentially just moving it off the page is like the best option. So another way we can use CSS to completely like alter the meaning or the structure of what's in our DOM is by having a completely different source order to what is visually painted on the screen. So we can have something like this, where um, we have like our footer on the top, like the header somewhere in the middle, main, which is not what we actually want it to look like. And then we just use CSS to, I guess, quote unquote, fix everything. And I think this sort of brings up one of the, I guess, the key issues or, um, yeah, key issues with new tools like CSS Grid and Flexbox in that they give us that power or um, that ability to have that actually like true separation between like presentation and the actual like structure in our CSS and our HTML. But um, I think as Rachel Andrew put this, with that great power comes a lot of great responsibility because while it does allow us to have that proper separation, then that also enables us to do like crazy things in terms of like just defining our DOM in whatever way and then quote unquote like fixing everything with our CSS. So I'll say my next tip is about writing CSS with the default accessible styles in mind. So as we all know, every browser ships with their own default style sheets, which um, is has been created in a way to be as accessible to, I would say, as like wide range of websites as possible. So it's kind of like a really good default that should apply to as many different use cases as possible. The example I always like to give is with like the classic button. So just by using the classic button elements and not writing any CSS, you get something that is really accessible in terms of its styling. So you have you know, proper text and element sizes, you have like appropriate colors and contrast, you have like properly styled hover, focus, and active states. And you get all of that just by using the simple HTML elements. You don't have to write a single line of CSS. And that's kind of why I like to think any additional CSS, uh, think of any additional CSS I write as like standing on the shoulders of the giants, which in this case, I guess, is the default browser CSS in that like, anything I write should be done understanding why the default was done in the way it is done and writing it in a way that's not going to, I guess, detract from it. So if I wanted to change the default font size, don't then just like make it tiny so nobody can read it. Or like if I wanted to change the color, don't then just make it again unreadable because of the contrast. 
And I think another major issue we see a lot is with the different hover focus active states because these are generally a bit difficult or I'll say a lot difficult to work with. Um, they're very just like not standardized and I think when it comes to touch screen it's just a real pain because they're basically all the same thing. And then even the way in which you define it in your style sheet is a bit crazy, like if you defined it one way only, like if you put active, then focus, then hover, then only the hover styles will actually show up. So you actually have to define it in the right way, but basically it's just like a pain to work with. Um, but we have to remember that it's a, there's a reason that it's there, right? It's really important because if you are trying to navigate through anything, only using your keyboard, these like different states or these styled states are the only way that you'll know where you are or like what you're interacting with. So it is really important. So if we're going to you know, remove the um, focus outlines, for example, we should you know, replace it with something else, not just remove it entirely. Or use like um, new pseudo classes like the focus visible, which will allow you to just style where a browser thinks it should be visible. So if somebody was using like tabbing into an element instead of um, clicking onto it. But I guess the summary here is that, you know, whenever we're writing custom CSS, it should be done pretty cautiously and with awareness that if you're gonna change something, it should be for a good reason and it shouldn't be in a way that's like destructive to what was written before. So yeah, we've covered a lot about what we can't do with CSS, which is not to say don't write <laughs> any CSS. There's basically, there's really a lot that we can do to actually make our CSS additive and actually like improve accessibility as well. So I think um, one of the great ways in which we can use CSS in a way that's actually positive is improving on the default accessible styles. So um, I did mention that you know, the default browser styles are sort of like a base and are meant to be as accessible to as many different websites as possible. But what that basically means is that they're not going to be necessarily optimized for any particular website. So for example, if we use, look at this guideline, 1.4.8, which says, you know, text box should be no wider than 80 characters and then line height specifications. And the default browser CSS generally doesn't actually meet these um, criteria. So you can see that like text size is not exactly what it should be and then line height and all of that stuff. And this is not necessarily like a fault in the default CSS, like they, I guess, are aware of it, but the guideline is specifically for very text heavy sites. So it wouldn't necessarily make sense that the default should be what is for a specific use case. So this is a great place or a great way to actually write some custom CSS in a way that would be additive. So just adding a few lines to actually fix it for your particular use case. Another example is bypass box, so the skip links that you might see. So for example, if um, you're on Wikipedia and you hit tab, you can see it shows a jump to content um, link at the top. Let's see if it'll go back there. Yeah, then it will just basically push you into um, the main content of the page. And that's something that, again, doesn't necessarily make sense to just be added to every single website by default. So that's a great place in which, like, if you're gonna write some custom HTML and CSS, then if it's good for your particular website, then it's something that you can add. So another thing we can do is write our CSS in a way that like adapts to different device capabilities. And I'd say like the, you know, the classic way of doing this is with the CSS cascade. So just making sure that if we are using like newer features, like maybe CSS variable. Um, if we, if the browser does support it, of course it would use it, but then we also have like a fallback in case it doesn't. But I guess the modern way of doing this now is with feature queries, which allow us to, you know, query a particular property value pair and see if the browser does support it. And if it does, then you can write a whole block of CSS. So typical example of this is if we um, want to use like display grid, we can put that within a feature query um, and we can have like legacy code outside of that. Maybe not display table, maybe something else, but yeah, that's basically the idea. Um, and then besides adapting to different device capabilities, we can also adapt our CSS to the different and 
end user types. So um, early in the stage of CSS, there was this concept of user style sheets, which was pretty popular at the time. It's basically a style sheet that you as a user could um, write and then upload to your browser, and then it would be applied to all websites that you go to. So it's basically a way for you to like customize your experience. So you could set everything to dark mode or set a specific color contrast if that is something that you want. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, it didn't really take off. And I think back in like 2013 or something, it was just removed from Chrome. But I think we still have this core tenet of the web that you know users should have as much control over the environment they use to access the web as possible. And nowadays, that's like represented in these different preference-based media queries. So for example, we can adapt to a user's preference to have reduced motion. So we can have like something, um, a pretty like intense animation by default. And then if a user prefers reduced motion, then we can have something a bit more scaled back or removed entirely, depending on your particular use case. And this is something that um, a user will set in their own device settings. So for example, on the Mac, if you go under accessibility settings, you can see that you can have this like reduced motion um, option there. And then it's something that websites can then like hook into and then adapt um, their websites based on that. And this is just one example of a preference-based media query. So we have ability to adapt to data preferences, to color preferences, to contrast preferences, to transparency preferences, and I think there should be more of these coming out as well. And basically, the core of this, again, is just about giving users as much control over their experience as possible. And I think this is a great way that we can write CSS in a way that actually really improves accessibility. So that is it for CSS and accessibility. So basically, we've just covered that you know we shouldn't use CSS for the job of HTML, which is meaning of content. So we shouldn't use it to add or change any of that um, semantics. And then we shouldn't write CSS in a way that's going to detract from the default accessible styles. But we can do it in a way that's going to improve on it and also just adapt to different device capabilities and also end user preferences. So next, JavaScript and accessibility. So like with CSS, it's always good to go back and then actually think about what the purpose of JavaScript is. And that is to make web pages more interactive. And I always put an extra emphasis on the more because I think at times we tend to forget that HTML by itself is actually already pretty interactive. And JavaScript is just something we can use to add to make it even more interactive. So we already have so many elements that actually allow us to create pretty dynamic experiences and pretty powerful web applications without having to add JavaScript to the mix just yet. And that's why I think J JavaScript should ultimately be used as something to enhance a website. So like the icing on the cake, it's not something that you absolutely need to have, but it's something that is nice to have and nice to add. And that brings me to the first point, which is that we shouldn't be using JavaScript um, for functionality that HTML already provides. So going back again to revisiting um, the classic button example. So again, just by using a button element, we get a lot of functionality. So it's able to be triggered by mouse, enter key, and spacebar. It's focusable by our keyboard and other input devices. And it already has that accessible name and state that is communicated to assistive technologies. And like I said, we get all of that just by using the correct HTML element. But what if we decided, OK, we want to like use a div for, for, for whatever reason, and we wanted to try to recreate the same functionality. And basically, the gist is that we'll have to put in a whole lot extra work just to achieve the same functionality that we already had. So we're going to have to add like an attribute to make sure that we can focus on it. We're going to have to add like a role so that it's you know, um, the purpose of the element is able to be communicated to assistive technologies. We're going to have to make sure that, you know, it can be triggered by an enter key and a space bar. If it's like a toggle button, we need to then handle the state of it all. And basically, at the end of the job, <laughs> at the end of the at the end of doing all of that, you're just like, OK, why? Because I'm just working against myself, basically. 
And I think another element that gets um, misused a lot or not used for whatever reason is like the anchor element versus the button. So instead of just using a regular link that will navigate you to a page, we see a lot of like buttons and then some sort of like extra functionality to just do that same navigation. And I think this isn't always like for no reason. Like sometimes maybe as part of a navigation, you want to do some other things as well. So you just think, okay, let me just abstract everything into JavaScript. But I think um, one of the things that we also always need to think about is that when we're trying to make any enhancements with JavaScript, we need to do it in a way that's as unobtrusive as possible. So doing it in a way that's like additive and doesn't detracts from the default experience that we already have. So a good solution here would be to just still have the actual anchor element that would still work. But then you can then add on the JavaScript as well. So you still have, like, when you click, you trigger this um, function, which will just prevent the default and then do all the other things that you maybe wanted to do. And then if, for whatever reason, like JavaScript is not enabled, then we still have that default experience that works well without it. And I think like the key here is having that default experience in the first place and then preventing it and then doing something that's additive on top of it. And that's why I think using you know event.prevent defaults puts you in the right state of mind because you're like, okay, there's actually a default experience that I'm going to prevent and then do this something else on top of that. So this next point, I guess, requires a bit more nuance. Um, so wherever possible, don't require JavaScript for critical features. And I think the reason it requires a lot of nuance is because obviously nowadays, with the web applications we built, there are cases where it does make sense that you would need to require JavaScript. So I think a good example of this is Figma. So this is actually the Figma website if you had JavaScript disabled. And I think for something like an in-browser Photoshop or photo editing software. Like, I don't think that is something that would make sense that you need to have a non-JavaScript experience for. Like, you, you kind of need JavaScript to do this. And that's not to say that this experience can't be improved on, because I think you could maybe at the very least still just have like a no script tab and like some explanation as to why nothing loads. But I think this is basically just an example of, well, OK, you do actually need JavaScript. But I think, on the other hand, there's other experiences that could work pretty well without JavaScript. So I think Google Search is a good example of this. So you can see that um, with no JavaScript, you can still access like the core feature of the website, which is being able to search and see your results. And then if you do have JavaScript enabled, things are you know a bit fancier. Like you get the autocomplete, you get more rich results, you get ads, which I'm sure you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, all that extra great stuff. But yeah, like I said, it's not just like black and white, you know, JavaScript is bad for some reason. Like even in the web content accessibility guidelines, they've said that it is actually okay to require JavaScript um, for certain web applications. But I think this brings up like a difference in the categories of people that I talked about before, because I think different groups have very different access needs. So I think if we were looking at people with physical um, disabilities, they're a bit more likely to rely on JavaScript. So I think um, only 0.07% of screen readers have JavaScript disabled, but the global average is 1%. So people who are using assistive technologies are more likely to have JavaScript enabled. But if we're looking at people with socioeconomic restrictions, they're basically the opposite, and they're more likely to avoid JavaScript. So um, the Sudanese mobile browsing population, over 50% is with Opera Mini, which is a browser that basically either severely reduces or just completely eliminates all JavaScript. And I mean, the reason is because compared to HTML and CSS, JavaScript just exponentially increases the file size or the file size of any website. So I think just by cutting out JavaScript, or even just by adding JavaScript, you're drastically changing what the page size is going to be. But I think in the end, it's all about finding the balance that makes sense for your particular websites. And if, for example, you're going to create a website that was just for people using screen readers in like 
a particular part of the world where they're going to have the fastest internet and all of that stuff, then it wouldn't really make sense for you to invest a whole lot of energy in like creating a whole experience for people who will have JavaScript disabled. But if you know that like 99% of your users are going to be using Opera Mini, then I don't think it makes sense to write like a single line of JavaScript. You might as well completely invest in the non-JavaScript experience. But if you're making a website like a Google or like a government website where you actually have to look at as wide a population as possible, then you kind of need to weigh both of these scenarios almost equally. But the point is, you know, JavaScript isn't the enemy. Just adding JavaScript doesn't make it inaccessible. And actually, there's a lot of ways that we can use JavaScript to improve the accessibility of a website. So for example, we can actually improve on any default accessible behavior. So for example, looking at this guideline 3.3, which is about helping users avoid and correct mistakes. So um, if we just have a simple HTML form, this is, you know, like to some extent fulfilled. So like if I had required on this field and somebody tried to submit, you would see that you would get a, oh, please fill in this field um, toggle. But the guideline actually suggests going a bit further than this. Like they say, you know, where possible, also if there's errors, also provide like suggestions for um, correction. And this is something that we can only really achieve with JavaScript. So for example, I think Google does a good job with this. Like if you type in an email that already exists, they can tell you, oh, this is already taken and also provide like suggestions for correction. And that's something that you can really only do with JavaScript. <laughs> And another thing to note is that um, some HTML elements are not actually accessible enough yet, so much so that we might actually need JavaScript in order to correct them. So we see this with like the native video elements. So across the browsers, the experience isn't always standard and it isn't always accessible. So things like um, we, the controls aren't always like focusable via keyboard. Um, we can't always like pause and play using the space bar. And there's generally no consistent like arrow key support for the scrubber and a bunch of other things. And this is something that the W3C acknowledges. So they acknowledge that, yes, there are actually shortcomings with this default experience. And they suggest that, OK, you can actually use, or you should actually use JavaScript to try to improve or fix this. So luckily for us, there's a bunch of you know, accessible media players out there. So it's not something we have to actually do ourselves. But the point here is that sometimes we do actually need JavaScript to create a, an experience that is truly accessible. And another situation in which we actually do really need to use JavaScript is when we're creating new UI components that don't yet exist in HTML. So as we know, the world of web development typically moves a whole lot faster than browsers can catch up. And this is mostly a good thing. We don't necessarily want browsers to like just jump in on the newest craze and like, I don't know, make tailwind required for everything or something like that. So um, we know that there's going to be patterns in the world of web development that aren't necessarily in browsers yet. So for example, we have a lot of things like, oh, a tooltip or a toggle. That's not something that we can just have put in one of these elements and then it's all done. So an example of this is like a carousel. So essentially a list of elements, probably like images. There's usually like controls to like go between them, maybe a pause and play. This isn't something that we have just a plug and play HTML element for. So it's something that we actually have to build for ourselves. And if we were looking at the web content accessibility guidelines, we can pick out a few guidelines that would be related to carousels so that we can actually build this new element, taking into account all of these different things. So for example, this guideline is about making sure that any structure is conveyed through um, that is, can be programmatically determined. And this just basically means you know, using the right elements. So in this case, if we're going to create a carousel, we would use something like an unordered list. And then these elements or these guidelines are about making sure that there's like accessible controls to like pause, play, navigate through the content. And that's basically just about adding the controls, hopefully using the actual button elements. So having 
elements like toggle to play and then having like previous and next slide buttons as well. And then this guideline is about making sure that we have the accessible names, roles, and states for each of the different components. So we would have to add things like area role, area labels, area controls, all of that stuff. And this is basically, um, or this is definitely a lot of work. And I guess the point here is that whenever we're creating these new components, again, like how we write custom CSS, we need to do it cautiously because it's very easy to create one of these components and make them work just for one type of user. And so when we're doing it, we need to actually understand, I guess, the ramifications of doing so and write it like cautiously. And we do have help for that. So um, the W3C have this website where they list a bunch of different components and then the accessibility considerations for them. So it's not something you have to necessarily think up all by yourself. But we also have third-party websites, so like friend.co, which has some components that you can kind of like just drag and drop, more or less. Or I really like the Inclusive Components blog, which goes a, a bit more of like a deep dive into these components and their various like accessibility considerations. So yeah, that's it for JavaScript and accessibility. Um, basically, what we've covered, again, we shouldn't be using JavaScript for what HTML's job is. So, or what we can already do with HTML. And you know, wherever possible, don't require JavaScript for something for like a critical feature, but we can definitely use JavaScript to improve on the default um, um, components, especially if they're not accessible enough, and also especially when we're creating new components. So the reason why I love to go back to this quote is because it kind of represents a shift in how we think about web accessibility. Because I think we often have this idea that you, know, you have a website and then your job is now to make it accessible. It's like almost an extra thing that you do on the end. But this sort of like kind of reframes that and actually says, no, actually the default is that it is accessible. I really love how George Kemp put it in this article where he wrote, like, if someone says, oh, make a website accessible, you should instead say, actually, I'm not going to make it inaccessible in the first place. So thank you.